on behalf of us all at HPKU College of Law and the Qatar International Court and the Dispute Resolution Center, I would like to welcome you all to our today's session on the functioning of courts in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm George Dimitropoulos, a faculty member at HPKU College of Law, and will be moderating today's webinar. I would like to thank you all for your participation, our students, alumni, our community. And this webinar builds on the successful and long-standing collaboration of our two institutions, HPKU and Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center, and inaugurates a new series of online events. We will be, in fact, co-organizing a second event on the 2nd of September on legal issues arising out of the pandemic with Sir William Blair as the speaker. We would like to thank Lord Thomas, the President of the Court, Faisal Al Sahuti, the CEO of the Court, and of course, Christopher Grout, the Register of the Court, for the collaboration. We're more than happy to take questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom right part of our, uh, of our platform. The Q&A session will take place at the end of the webinar, but feel free to send your questions during the presentation by our speakers. A recorded version of the webinar will be available on the HPKU uh, website. Now I will briefly present our wonderful panel and we will then go straight to the presentations. Our first speaker is Lord Thomas. Lord Thomas has been president of the Qatar International Court since 2018. In 1996, he was appointed a High Court Judge and was assigned to the Queen's Bench Division, serving on the Commercial Court and appointed to the Privy Council, where he served as a senior presiding judge from 2003 to 2006. In 2008, Lord Thomas was appointed Vice President of the Queen's Bench Division and Deputy Head of Criminal Justice. In 2011, he became President of the Queen's Bench Division and in 2013 became Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. Our second speaker is Chief Judge Barbara Lynn uh, uh, at the District Court for the Northern District of Texas in the United States. Prior to assuming the federal bench in 2000, Judge Lynn was a partner with Carrington Coleman in Dallas. Judge Lynn was designated by the National Law Journal in 1998 as one of the 50 most influential women attorneys in the country. She served as chair of the ABA's uh, uh, section of litigation and, uh, jud uh, and judicial division. Judge Lynn was the first recipient of the Louise Raggio Award given by the Dallas Women Lawyers Association for her contributions to the profession. In 2010, she was recognized by the International Women's Forum with the Women Who Make a Difference Award. In 2011, an intellectual property American Inn of Court chapter was designated the Honorable Barbara Lynn American Inn of Court. Finally, Judge Lynn received the State Bar's Samuel Pesara Outstanding Jurist Award in 2019. Our third speaker is Christopher uh, Grout, who has been the Registrar of the Qatar International Court since 2012. From 2007 to 2009, he worked for the Ministry of, uh, of Justice at the Court of Appeal, the Criminal Division, before uh, joining uh, uh, 50 New Bridge Street, where he specialized as a criminal defense barrister. Christopher is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and in 2019 was also appointed as Deputy District Judge in England and uh, Wales. Finally, the Dean of HPKU College of Law, Dr. Susan Karamanian. Dr. Susan Karamanian is the Dean of HPKU's College of Law and she previously held leadership positions at the American University of, uh, of Sharjah and the George Washington University Law School. She is a member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law. She is also a member of the Council on Foreign, uh, on Foreign Relations, the American Council on Germany, the American Bar Foundation, and the Texas Bar Foundation. This is our wonderful panel for today. We look forward both uh, to the presentations as well as uh, the, the discussion. Uh, Lord Thomas, the floor is yours. Hello and good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have, I hope, got my timing right because I'm speaking to you from the United Kingdom. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, HBKU for putting this on. Uh, it is marvelously kind of, of the Dean, uh, Professor Georgios, uh, Dimitros, and uh, the web team there to organize all of this. And I'm very grateful to Judge Lynn for joining us early in the morning uh, from Texas. The really forced us, I think, as judges, both in Qatar and from my experience in the UK, to look again at the way our legal system was functioning, because it was quite clear we could not allow the courts to stop. It would have built up an unacceptable backlog. 
businessmen would have needed decisions uh, on their contracts. And there is always the matter of administrative decisions by the government being reviewed. And least, uh, or last but not least, the legal profession. Uh, it would have been, I think, a disaster for many law firms if their litigation just stopped. So we, we looked at what should be done and how we could carry on, taking into account A, the lockdown, B, safe distancing, which has proved the biggest problem, and above all, maintaining public confidence by ensuring that what we did commanded public confidence and was as good as a real hearing. Online justice simply can't be second class justice. Now, each country uh, approached the matter differently. A and I will speak primarily from the position of Qatar and also from the provision of the, of the UK, or should I say within the UK, particularly England and Wales. Much depended on what the courts had got already. First of all, how good was their electronic filing system? Secondly, were their judges used to case management? Thirdly, had they been used to audio uh, hearings? And fourthly, and finally, and most important, were they used to the use of video links? Now, uh, that is, I think, both in the UK and in Qatar, to look at and appraise our systems. The most important uh, first step is to ensure your filing system is accessible to the public. It's no use having the courts functioning if documents can't be filed electronically. Secondly, <clears throat> where possible, in countries where people were not as used to video links, audio hearings uh, were used. My own view and my experience has been that audio hearings will work for some types of proceedings, but they won't work for the more difficult cases. And then you need a good, therefore you need a good video system. And there are a lot of uh, issues that you have to take account of. First, uh, and I say this with um, a deference to the technologically <coughs> skilled among you, the system must be relatively easy to use. Uh, secondly, it's got to cope with drops in quality. As no doubt Christopher will say, one of the difficulties we've encountered is video, to, video links sometimes are very variable and problems occur if the lawyers drop out. Thirdly, it's got to have security and more of that anon. Uh, <coughs> must enable judges to communicate with one another, particularly where more than one judge is sitting as happens in Qatar, or as happens on all appeals. But you've also got to make provision, though this is normally done separately, for lawyers to be able to, lawyers in the same team, to be able to communicate with one another. And then it's got to integrate with other systems. Uh, it's got to be able to handle documents uh, that are on the court's filing system, if at all possible. And finally, because justice has to be open, it must enable integration so that the public can see what is going on. I think those are the main points that we had to take into account. So you first of all <clears throat> look at how good is the system. You've then got to think about the procedural changes that need to be made. These have not been, in the case either of Qatar or uh, in England and Wales, very extensive, simply because the, in both countries, um, the system had already moved to enabling people uh, to deal with matters uh, through the use of video technology. And then finally, we looked at the various platforms. Um, some uh, courts in, in England and Wales use Skype. This has not proved generally satisfactory. Then uh, there has been a lot of use of Zoom. Uh, though questions have arisen uh, about its security. Then what for the platform we're using today, Cisco's WebEx has proved uh, very useful. Uh, that's the system that the Qatar International Court is currently using, plus the UK Supreme Court. Uh, people have also used Teams, but that doesn't seem to quite so well, and a host of other different systems, including <coughs> uh, Pepix, Kindly Cloud, BlueJeans, Polycom, and others. And one or two have been rash enough to try and experiment with their own systems, 
but that generally has not been successful. Now, what use, therefore, have you been able to make of systems? And I think here yeah, I will pause and go through my experience in the UK and my experience in Qatar. While the pandemic has been uh, in uh, play, we haven't had an oral hearing from an, on an appeal. Uh, but I have participated in one in the UK, and uh, the system worked extremely well. I was very, very pleased um, with the way in which it went. The oral arguments were very well presented. <clears throat> the operator of the system, and I'll come to that in a moment, was very good. And um, it, it, it works fine. I don't think there are any disadvantages to doing appeals. It looks very much like uh, a real court hearing. And although people might miss the uh, journey to court, uh, it works, I think, well. And the public can easily watch in because there is no problem at all in that happening. Can I turn to, to trials? And I'd like to divide out the trial and first of all, deal with our with experience in Qatar and elsewhere in dealing with what I call high value commercial type cases. <clears throat> Here, on the whole, uh, certainly in Qatar, this has worked very well. Um, and in uh, the UK, generally, it's worked pretty well as well. The two main concerns uh, that have arisen is, first of all, can you assess whether a witness is reliable or, more importantly, in some cases, telling the truth? On the whole, the experience, although people have been doubtful at first about it, experience has shown that it, it works pretty well, providing you take precautions to ensure that someone isn't sitting behind the camera telling the witness what to do or what to say. <clears throat> there then has arisen a question, well, if people don't come to court and they don't know they're going to have their day in court, is there the pressure of uh, confrontation, the pressure to settle? I don't think uh, that's been a factor. So I think for high value cases, uh, going uh, to a system of this kind has worked very well. The picture is very different. I can't say this in relation to Qatar, but certainly in relation to the UK, that smaller cases have not been as satisfactory, partly um, be because um, the men some of the law firms have not had the appropriate resources. Sometimes the judges haven't had the right uh, IT equipment. Uh, and um, it, it, it particularly in family cases, though with one exception, uh, these have proved to um, be okay, but we haven't got them yet in the UK to the standard they should be at. A more dismal picture arises in relation to litigants in person. They've turned out to, uh, to be two problems. One is uh, a technical issue. People, they're not used to doing things in uh, online and therefore find a system quite difficult. And secondly, because they're not in court, they don't quite understand the formality, which is essential for the proper conduct of, of proceedings. And finally, I think they find that not having legal advice is a bigger uh, problem if you're trying to do things over the video link. Uh, so, I, I um, think that with litigants in person, the system does need a lot more looking at and a, prepar and a preparedness on behalf part of the state to be able uh, to deal um, with providing much more advice to litigants in person. And finally, as regards to trial by jury, we don't generally in England and Wales have trial by jury for anything other than criminal cases. Uh, that we have restored them recently, uh, but if people want to ask questions, I can say a bit more about it. Social distancing is obviously a very, very substantial problem. Now, <clears throat> those are my, my, that's my experience of how the system has worked. I just sort of raise, finally, about six issues, which I think have to be taken into account. First, it's essential that there's good technical like 
one, one's had on this from HBKU. You need someone who is competent, who runs the system, can set it up. You can't do without that. And secondly, there's been experience with the use of documents. You need, first of all, to, be, to have a system for the documents that are held by the judge and by the parties to be a robust and searchable system for people not to have overloaded the judges. But there is a much more difficult issue, which I think uh, people haven't yet properly begun, begun to confront. And that is, if you make documents available online during the course of a hearing, you are creating a huge bank for people to scrape. Uh, but that's a different issue, but one probably of very considerable long-term significance. A third issue relates to, well, if the judge has got all the documents and read it all beforehand, has the judge made up his mind or her mind? Uh, I think this is not really a problem, um, but it's a, more a problem of perception. But then there are the issue of interpreters. This is not easy to operate. I was participating in a witness session for in our parliament. And there we uh, had to adopt the system of allowing someone to provide simultaneous translation. That worked pretty well, um, but I, 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 you have got to have the facility for simultaneous translation. And then there's the question of, is it more tiring doing things by video? Uh, some people's experience is that it is. I personally haven't had that experience, but I do think that <clears throat> the question of how long you have a session going for is something that we really need more experience of. The next issue I wanted to raise, because this ultimately is very, very important for the clients, uh, is it cheaper? Uh, I think the jury is still out. We need to do a lot more research about that, because obviously um, there is, in a sense, a saving to the state, because it doesn't need so many courtrooms. Uh, but although it will need to spend more money on uh, the provision of good technical assistance, probably in the end it's a saving. But you can't have a justice system uh, that saves um, or, or at the expense of making it more expensive for the individuals. And finally, there's ADR. I think uh, it's very important for functioning of all systems that ADR works properly, and we have to look more closely at the integration of the system. So all in all, my own view is uh, the COVID-19 uh, has changed the court system probably forever. I think we will inevitably, and this is the view in the UK and certainly my view in Qatar, that we will not go back to interlocutory hearings uh, in person, but we may well have trials. That is an open question as to when and how the pandemic will pan out. Thank you very much. I'm happy to develop any of the points the one I've left out is jury trials, because I thought to try and deal with that in the time available was too complicated. But thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to hearing from the other contributors. Wonderful, Lord Thomas. Thank you so much for, the, for your uh, contribution to our uh, discussion. Um, I would like to, uh, to remind uh, uh, our audience that uh, uh, you can use uh, the Q&A uh, tab on the, uh, on the bottom right hand of, uh, of, of WebEx uh, to type in uh, questions, uh, please, to all panelists. Thank you so much again, Lord Thomas. Judge Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, where I am, I will say good morning, uh, Lord Thomas. It is a great pleasure to see you again. And thank you for allowing me to participate in this interesting conversation. I'm going to pick up in just a moment where Lord Thomas left off. Uh, I think I will spend most of my discussing uh, a jury trial since uh, I had uh, the unique honor of presiding over an in-person uh, jury trial at the beginning of June, uh, obviously since the pandemic. And I have some reflections about that that I thought might be of interest. Uh, to our audience, but let me pick up on just uh, a random selection of thoughts uh, resulting from Lord Thomas's very interesting uh, remarks. Uh, first of all, in the United States, of course, we have uh, a number of different tribunals and we are not obligated to all follow each other. So uh, the states uh, have different procedures that they are employing, uh, different technologies that they are using, I think it is fair to say that very few states have had in-person jury trials since the pandemic uh, 
uh, began. And so most of them are experimenting with different types of technology using the platforms that but there is a great uh, variance from state to state about that. Even with federal system, there are variances. Uh, judges are using the technologies that they're most comfortable with. Uh, most of us are using a WebEx platform, but uh, some are experimenting with Zoom calls. Uh, there are certain aspects of Zoom that uh, judges like better, and that particularly involves the ability to put people into different rooms during a session. Uh, all of these have their own challenges. Uh, some people worry about security with Zoom in particular, and we are all working through that. I think it is fair to say that most judges in the United States are not technologists, and so they have struggled some with these technologies. Now, at the courts of appeal, there have been for many years the ability to participate in an oral argument through remote technologies. I about every year and a half or so, I sit as a visiting judge with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, for many years, there have been hearings uh, on occasion that have been conducted remotely. Uh, typically, those are cases where a party is represented by a legal services organization that cannot afford uh, to travel to where the hearing would otherwise be conducted. So those have proceeded. Uh, there already was a technology in place to accomplish a hearing in that way, and those have continued. But for other courts, particularly trial courts, uh, the judges do not have much experience in conducting trials remotely, and so there have been some struggles with being able to do so effectively. We also are greatly challenged by the need to have remote hearings with people who are in custody in a prison setting. Uh, first of all, the pandemic uh, is raging in many of our prison facilities. That is obviously a complication for lawyers to be able to meet in person with their clients. Even when they can meet in person with their clients, uh, the technology is often not uh, sufficient to handle the load that is required. We in the Northern District of Texas house many of our detainees. These are people who are incarcerated before they have been convicted because they are either a flight risk or a danger to the community. So they are being held pending trial. Obviously, that presents the need to have a trial uh, with reasonable speed. But while they are in custody, they are often housed in what are state or local facilities that are under contract to the federal government. And so those facilities have to make their detainees uh, available to other courts as well. So there is a great demand on the system and often the systems are just not uh, up to snuff to handle uh, such a great load. Uh, along with that comes challenges with respect to the attorney-client privilege because if lawyers cannot get into the facility, they're having conversations with their clients typically by telephone. Often those phones are in rooms with uh, personnel from the facility and so there's a great challenge to making sure that the attorney-client privilege is honored and protected. So we have, I would say as an overall proposition, we have continued uh, to have hearings as necessary. There have been a limited number of in-person proceedings. When a person is arrested, they have to see a federal magistrate judge and those hearings typically are in person. And then the person uh, has an initial appearance to determine whether they are released on bond. So we have proceeded with a combination of in-person proceedings and remote proceedings. And I'll use the phrase that Lord Thomas used, the jury is still out on whether this is effective or not. Uh, we have within the federal system, <clears throat> very uh, excellent uh, technology professionals who work for the courts, uh, but they have to interface with local facilities. And sometimes that has presented great difficulties. So that is all I will say by overview with respect to uh, remote proceedings involving criminal matters. For civil matters, uh, I think remote proceedings have worked quite effectively. Uh, lawyers generally are used to using uh, technology in civil cases and oral arguments have been presented, I think, quite effectively. There have also been evidentiary hearings, particularly relating to injunction matters. And the lawyers uh, have used those technologies quite well. Uh, we have the same challenges with documents that Lord Thomas mentioned. 
and a concern about these documents being available widely and possibly being uh, subject to intrusions uh, online. So those are all things that uh, present problems that we are all trying to work through. I will spend the balance of my time talking briefly about the trial that I conducted at the beginning of June. Uh, this was a criminal case, uh, one defendant, uh, one count involving uh, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. So it took a lot of advanced planning and I think uh, ate up a lot of resources, uh, but it was necessary, I think, and important to see whether we could conduct a fair trial uh, within the era of the pandemic. And I think the conclusion was uh, that we could, but there are a lot of uh, footnotes and admonitions that I will add when I conclude my uh, brief remarks about the trial. So we began by sending out questionnaires uh, to a large group of citizens, uh, 100 people, more people than we would typically uh, contact about a criminal jury trial of the nature I described. Uh, the vast majority of them uh, returned their questionnaires. There was a separate opportunity for them to fill out a questionnaire explaining why COVID-19 presented a particular challenge for them personally. Either they or members of their family were at particular high risk and they had an opportunity uh, to present that. After we received the questionnaires, uh, we made them accessible to the lawyers in a secure website. Uh, they were able to agree on a number of panelists that they agreed I would excuse in advance of the trial, and I did excuse them. I excused some others based on their responses to the questionnaires. And then we had roughly 50 people who were qualified, who did not have exemptions or excuses that I found at that uh, time of the tr in the proceedings to be tenable. So we called down to court uh, 45 people. We called them in three groups of 15 each uh, to our central jury room. They were very well spaced in that room. Uh, we furnished to them face shields so that we could see them when they were answering questions that I asked and that the lawyers asked. Uh, this process is referred to uh, in Texas. I'm embarrassed to say this in front of Lord Thomas. It is properly pronounced the voir dire, but in Texas, we take great pride in mispronouncing uh, certain words. And so in Texas, we call it the voir dire. So you will excuse me if I speak a little Texan here. I know Lord Thomas is shocked at this uh, pronunciation, but that's the way it is in Texas. And I have to abide by the rules in my locality. So when we had uh, the 45 people down for voir dire uh, in three groups, uh, I asked questions. Uh, I and the lawyers were all seated behind a plexiglass screen. Uh, we asked questions for about an hour and a half of the panel in groups and individually. After each session, uh, the lawyers uh, exercised any challenges that they had for cause, and I excused those jurors as to whom I thought cause was demonstrated. Um, after the three sessions were concluded, the lawyers exercised what we call peremptory strikes, uh, challenging jurors just uh, because they did not think they would be fair and impartial in the particular case. Uh, when that was concluded, we had a sufficient number to seat a jury of 12, which is required in the United States in a criminal matter with two alternates. And I kept two more jurors just to make sure that the requisite number appeared the first day, which they did. Uh, we had to transport those jurors up to the court floor. I'm in a federal building uh, that has a courthouse in it, but it is not a federal courthouse. There are other federal agencies in the building. In fact, we are not uh, the largest tenant of the building. So we transported people by elevator up to the court floor, two people at a time. I used another courtroom as the jury room so that there would be adequate spacing for them to be well spaced at more than the six foot guidelines, and they came there in the morning. Uh, I entered a special order authorizing us to give them lunch by uh, holding them there during the day. So they deliberated there at the end of the case. They had breaks there. Uh, they had lunch there, and uh, they came there in the morning, and that was uh, how we accommodated the need for spacing. Uh, when we began the trial, the jury sat in what is typically the gallery. Uh, we made the uh, jury box, the witness box. We set up uh, plexiglass shields around the witness. 
when the witness uh, was seated, then the witness removed a face mask. All participants in the trial, including me, had to wear either a face shield or a face mask, uh, except for the witness during testimony, so that the jurors could see the witness and assess credibility. Uh, the lawyer the lectern speaking to the jury, and therefore, because of the way we set up the trial, they had their backs to me with my permission. Uh, I had a camera at the back of the courtroom that projected the view from the point of view of the jury, and I had a monitor on my uh, bench to do that. Uh, the lawyers were surrounded on three sides by another plexiglass screen, uh, and so therefore they were protected and the jurors were protected from them while they were speaking. Uh, we handled uh, documents uh, by not having the jurors touch the documents. Uh, they were all made available during deliberations on a flash drive and the presiding juror supervised that and we had a large monitor in the what was the jury room, the other courtroom for us for them to see the documents. Um, the, the trial went along uh, relatively smoothly. Uh, there were a few things I had to, as we say in the States, decide on the fly uh, because I didn't have any uh, guidance for how to do this. Um, for example, uh, a lawyer moved for a mistrial and instead of adjourning the jury, uh, I had him email me the basis for the mistrial so that I could respond to that without having the lawyers approach the bench since we were trying to achieve social distancing between me and the lawyers as well. Uh, when the case was concluded, uh, the jurors adjourned to what was uh, their deemed jury room. Uh, they deliberated in the uh, traditional manner, except that they were spaced away, and then they returned their verdict uh, at the conclusion of their deliberations. Uh, the defendant in this case was actually acquitted, found not guilty of the charges. I did speak to the jurors afterwards and had them uh, fill out questionnaires. They all felt that uh, we had well attended to their health and safety. In fact, they gave uh, the court a round of applause at the conclusion uh, of the case, which made me uh, feel more comfortable about the need to protect them. Um, I will say that uh, I think we demonstrated we had a fair jury. Uh, it contained a, a significant number of minority jurors. The defendant is African American, so he was concerned about that, but we did achieve a very diverse jury representative of our uh, community. I have two other cases that are set that are quite similar uh, in the allegations and the nature of them uh, set for the beginning of August and the end of August. Uh, I am keeping an eye on these numbers of rising cases in my community before making a final decision. But assuming we proceed, we will proceed uh, similarly. I have been in touch with a uh, health expert, uh, a specialist at our local medical school who has looked at my procedures and uh, given me comments and suggestions, but by and large has blessed those as uh, sufficient to protect the jury. I don't think we can do it this way on a very large scale, however, because it took up so many resources, 17 people in our clerk's office, uh, three courtrooms because we broadcast the trial into yet a third courtroom for those who could not fit into the courtroom given the spacing and watch the trial. Uh, we did not have the capacity to broadcast the trial outside of the uh, court because uh, we are subject to limitations uh, on our, from our Supreme Court on broadcasting uh, court proceedings, but we did make it available to the public if they could get to the courthouse. Uh, but the resource expenditure was uh, very significant. If we all have to use three courtrooms and the central jury room for an entire day, we will not be able to do this uh, in, in many cases at a time, obviously. So um, I'm optimistic that we have a, a path forward, but it's going to limit uh, considerably the number of cases that we can conduct at a time. I think I'll leave it there subject to questions as we proceed. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Judge Lynn, for sharing your uh, experience in uh, conducting uh, uh, a trial, a jury trial, in fact, during the uh, COVID era. Uh, and uh, the floor now uh, goes to uh, Christopher Grout, the Registrar of the Qatar International Court Dispute Resolution Center. Thank you very much, George. I just want to spend a few minutes talking about issues that relate to case management and some 
practical issues in relation to the way in which hearings are conducted. Insofar as case management is concerned, quite understandably, when people are talking about the functioning of courts in light of this particular pandemic, focus is paid to the way in which hearings themselves are conducted. Uh, but of course, the, the, the hearing is in the grand life cycle of a case, uh, only a comparatively small, or albeit important, uh, part of what is going on. Because as Lord Thomas alluded to in his opening remarks, the filing of cases and the management of cases really occupies most of the court's time. And when you're putting measures in place to ensure that a case runs smoothly, you can't just focus on the hearing itself, but it's important to focus on all those things that need to take place both before and after. And one of my particular interests and one of the functions that I perform in the International Court here in Qatar um, re revolves around case management. Now, we were fortunate in the Qatar Court to have established an e-court system uh, several years ago, which effectively allows all parties um, and those involved in the court, uh, whether they be litigants, lawyers, witnesses, judges, court staff, to interact with a case uh, through the e-court system, you know, which is uh, an entirely electronic uh, based system, allowing parties to file their proceedings online, allowing communications with the court to take place online, allowing judgments and orders to be issued electronically, and more recently being integrated with the court's video link technology so that hearings can take place through the system uh, without the need for parties to attend court in person. Now, luckily for us, uh, this was a system that we integrated several years ago. Now, we did that, of course, not anticipating uh, that the current pandemic would take place. Uh, but mercifully, because we had the system in place, it meant that we were able to respond uh, very quickly to ensuring that cases could continue without any downtime. And that's very important because what, of course, you don't want to happen and what is certainly happening in many other countries is for a backlog of cases to begin to pile up because the court is unable to deal with them uh, during the present time. It's right to say, certainly from the Qatar International Court's perspective, that no cases have been delayed or disrupted as a result of the current pandemic because we've been able to utilize uh, the e-court system in order to facilitate them. Uh, and that's important, of course, for parties because they want their cases resolved as quickly as possible and as cost efficiently as possible. And we've been able to provide that. O on a practical point, though, it's important that when you change the way you administer justice, A, your messaging is clear so that people know what to expect, and B, you have to take into account um, the practicalities and put in place measures to ensure that all people who are participating in an online hearing uh, know what is required of them. And before I talk a little bit about how we did that, I want to underline the importance of having procedural flexibility within a court's rules and regulations to allow all of that to happen. Because some of my colleagues that I've spoken to in other courts have said that although they would be able to take certain measures in order to ensure that cases were conducted in, an, in a nuanced way to meet the concerns of the pandemic, they haven't been able to because their underlying uh, regulatory framework in relation to the way in which the court operates simply doesn't allow them to. And that, of course, is a problem. It's, it's fundamentally important that the rules which govern proceedings before the court are flexible enough to allow proceedings to be conducted in ways which are nuanced and which can respond to difficult circumstances such as the, the present. The, the court in Qatar, like the civil courts in England, has an overriding objective contained within its procedural rules. And that overriding objective is to ensure that 
all cases are dealt with justly. And one of the specific factors that is taken into account in the rules is the appropriate use of technology to ensure that cases are dealt with in a way that's proportionate, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of the issues that need to be decided by the court. And so having that procedural flexibility ingrained in the rules allows the court to respond quickly when it needs to adapt the way it operates. Uh, moving on to some of the practical issues, again, uh, uh, as, um, uh, as Judge Lynn has demonstrated, there are ways in which you can make physical changes uh, to the way in which the court operates in order to accommodate a trial. Uh, the court in Qatar, the International Court, uh, took a different approach, as Lord Thomas alluded to, rather than making physical changes to the way the court operated. Uh, as I say, we simply moved all cases to an online format. Um, that's easy for us because we had the technology, but it's not without its difficulties and challenges. And it's best to try and confront those early on so that they don't disrupt the hearing. And to that end, what we decided to do was establish a set of what we call ground rules, which we distributed to the parties, the lawyers, and anyone else that was engaged in the case beforehand, uh, so that they knew uh, what was required of them. I won't go through the ground rules in any detail, but they covered things such as how the hearing was going to commence, what the etiquette would be in relation to those who were speaking when people wanted to interrupt, um, if there were IT issues, how those issues would be resolved, issues relating to recording. One of the one of the real issues when you're conducting proceedings over a platform such as this is that you have very little control over what people are doing with the information. So people could be uh, recording it, people could be making transcripts of it. Uh, in fact, the, the WebEx platform allows that to happen. And so the court needs to give careful thought as to whether it's going to put rules in place in relation to whether or not people can record parts of court hearings and if they can, what they can do with that information. And we covered all those sorts of things in our ground rules. And in the event that parties had any difficulties, there were measures in place that they could contact us, whether through the system or if the problem was with the system itself um, through email or through telephone. We uh, didn't have in the in the in the online hearings that we've done and we've done a, we've done a number now since since April we haven't had any significant problems but as Lord Thomas alluded to you, there are some things you can't control and you can't control for example the adequacy of the technology that different participants have and in a court like ours for example, in the first hearing, we had participants that were not only in different physical locations, but in a variety of countries. We had participants from Qatar, from Dubai, from the United Kingdom, from South Africa, all participating in, in one hearing. And of course, when that happens, uh, the different participants are going to have different technological capabilities. They're going to have uh, different uh, levels of confidence in using the systems. And so it's important that you have good IT support in the court, which we do, in order to help people uh, understand how to use the technology and also be there in the event of any difficulties. Uh, the final point I really want to make concerns the issue of public access to courts during a pandemic such as the present, because most courts operate in public that's important for issues of transparency and open justice. And there is certainly a risk that when everything goes online, the public at large are excluded. We uh, certainly at the Qatar International Court are very anxious to ensure that that doesn't happen. And so what we choose to do is live stream our proceedings uh, via the court's website so people can access the live stream and watch court uh, proceedings as if they were physically present. Now, that sounds easy to implement, and, and it is, uh, but courts generally will have to give careful consideration to the medium by which they choose to live stream. 
For example, some will just live stream through their website or through some other official communication. Some may utilize social media platforms. And of course, the more you broadcast your proceedings, the wider the potential audience is. And so whereas a typical courtroom doesn't generally tend to attract many members of the public uh, to come in and watch proceedings, when things are online, you may find that you soon have tens, hundreds, possibly even thousands of people uh, watching proceedings that wouldn't ordinarily do so. And so courts perhaps have to give some thought to how they manage that. But in principle, I think it must be right that if courts are being uh, conducting their proceedings entirely online, there have to be ways that the public and the media can be kept informed about what's happening. And so by utilizing uh, live streaming services, that's the obvious way to do it. It's not without its uh, difficulties and it's not without its concerns, but the principle I suggest must be the right one. And I shall leave my observations there. Thank you so much, Christopher. That was uh, extremely uh, insightful. Your experience uh, was, uh, uh, with your experience, uh, you have made possible for us to understand how uh, a trial uh, works at the Qatar National Court Dispute Resolution Center. And uh, then the floor moves now to uh, 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 Susan. Uh, uh, Susan, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, George. And I'd like to thank uh, Lord Thomas, uh, Judge Lynn, uh, Christopher Grout, who's also a, a judge back in, in England, although he's here in Qatar as well, and uh, my colleague, uh, George uh, Dimitropoulos. This has been a wonderful uh, forum so far. And uh, I bring to the, to the discussion, uh, having practiced law in, in Dallas, Texas, for uh, many years, many years ago, well before we had the uh, online um, uh, filing. I think online filing had just started when I when I when I left, um, and and um, so I have that perspective. But also, I'd like to to bring the perspective of of legal education um, because how has the pandemic affected how we prepare students to become advocates, uh, whether to appear in in a hearing or to handle, handle a trial. And mind you, we have differences in trial practice here in, in Qatar in, in the local courts. Uh, uh, there's a strong civil law uh, tradition. Uh, in, we heard the differences between um, the United Kingdom and the United States just on civil jury trials. And, and in the United States, uh, we, we have many civil jury trials while in the UK limited to largely the criminal cases. The second thing I would like to just focus on briefly in my remarks that has been touched on in, in, uh, in all the presentations uh, today is the public access issue. And two issues in particular uh, dealing with the public access are the first, the ability of the public to observe hearings and trials. Uh, we just heard uh, Christopher raise this issue in the context of, of, of live, live streams. But secondly, uh, the cost to citizens to participate in lawsuits and to do so in a timely and, a, and, and effective uh, manner. And how are we gonna have a broad public engagement given uh, the kinds of hurdles we've, we've, talk, we've been speaking about today? Now, in terms of the teaching, that's the first area I'd like to, to, to focus on. Um, HBKU Law School, like all the universities and law schools uh, around the world, um, um, pretty much all of them at least, have gone, uh, went online starting uh, March of, of, of this year. And uh, the remarkable uh, conclusion is how quickly our students adapted to the online uh, medium. Uh, the younger generation, if I may call you that, or generations, uh, are quite comfortable using the video technology and also in engaging in matters from, from, from a distance. And so the actual physical presence for, for, for many of our students is that we have found it was not essential because so much of how they communicate is through, through this medium. Um, and uh, that technology in the classroom, at least, enabled us to have an intense ex exchange between the, the, the teacher and the, and the, and the, and the uh, students. Now, the interesting aspect of this all has been that sustaining the intensity, and as, as Lord Thomas alluded to, just you know how tired one gets, is, is challenging. This is particularly true if you have a larger, a, a larger group of, of, of students. And so when you think about 
the engagement just in the in the in, in, in the classroom and the intensity that's involved, and you try to translate that into uh, a, 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 a trial or a court hearing, you can uh, uh, where there are a lot of issues that are at stake, pretend, potentially a lot of money or somebody's life is on the line, you can appreciate the serious seriousness of the issue. Now, in terms of education, there have been these wonderful uh, developments online, but one of the ones I'd just like to focus on is the extent to which our students have now participated in, in virtual a virtual uh, moot court, the William uh, Willem Viss International Arbitration Moot Court. Uh, competitors from all around the world were scheduled to come to Vienna or uh, they have a separate proceedings in Hong Kong, all uh, canceled due to the, the, the pandemic. But the competition itself was, was not canceled. Um, students from HBKU and students from all around the world argued uh, a case and they answered questions from, from an ar arbitrator in a completely virtual uh, envi environment with the opposing side also participating uh, uh, virtually. Uh, the medium was clearly cost saving um, and in terms of not having to worry about the airfare and, 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 uh, and hotel expenses and the like, and also effectively efficient. I mean, incredibly efficient. Uh, there were no worries about visas and there were no worries, of course, about uh, the virus. Um, I, I was reading in advance of our session today about some of the student experiences around the world. And uh, a student at a uh, university in, in Missouri wrote something about how they felt that the, the process itself was not as um, uh, uh, intense, that the anxiety level was ratcheted down, uh, being in a comfortable environment, being able to present from, from your own home and, and, and the like. But that, that could also give you a sense of false comfort because you are uh, on show, and this is uh, you know a major event in your life, arguing uh, in in a in a comp competition. Now, the advantage of the moot court uh, arbitration is that you could have a single arbitrator, or you could have uh, 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 three uh, arbitrators, and so the medium can be quite manageable. But when you start thinking of courts where there could be uh, um, um, uh, a beyond a panel of three, the Supreme Court of the United States sitting as, as nine justices or the International Court of Justice in which 15 judges are, are, are seating, you could, uh, seated, you could see some of the complications associated with that. Now, in terms of hearings as opposed to, to trials, uh, we simply need to prepare our law graduates uh, to use technology to their uh, benefit, uh, such as ways in which their oral adaptation advocacy skills could be the most effective uh, and best tailored to the medium. And also with a special focus on, on uh, listening. Uh, many times body language was always to be a signal, uh, but now we need to be focused probably more on, on somebody's eyes or, or their face and the like. As, as we said earlier, we don't know what's going on behind, behind, the, behind the scenes. Uh, and the background itself perhaps could be a form of distraction. Uh, the second issue in terms of advocacy is, is to, to be able to uh, uh, coordinate your answer, to, to listen to the judge. We always have this practice in, in, in our courts, at least. Once the judge speaks, you just simply stop. You cannot talk over uh, 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 the judge. But this medium sometimes um, can blur those distinctions. On the other hand, it can make those distinctions very clear, such as here, where we have designated time uh, for um, um, somebody to speak and, 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 and the like. Uh, but the old rule of don't interrupt the judge when he or she is asking a question could play out in different ways. Um, and the third is, I alluded to earlier in a couple of the presentations today, is the use of, of, of evidence and uh, the need for lawyers to be able to have that evidence prepared in advance in a usable uh, uh, way. Um, and I'm just curious about, you know, for hearings, for example, uh, whether we're going to see in-person hearings the way we, we, we uh, heard before, are they just going to become something of, of the past? Not the trial itself, but just hearings largely in which we're dealing with legal issues with, with some, some documents. And uh, if the judges have questions, they could uh, ask the questions through this medium, or they can just simply send questions and therefore uh, the hearing is resolved that way. I know that you know, in the Northern District of Texas in summary judgment practice was that uh, you would not have 
um, alive here. And I don't know if that's the case the case anymore, but that was an accepted um, um, uh, practice. Um, I think to a certain extent, uh, the online platform has enabled uh, public access. Now, the United States Supreme Court has shied away from cameras in, in the courtroom, uh, yet it uh, has adopted, uh, through the pandemic, telephone hearings uh, to which the public now has, has access. And this is a very important development. The court allowed uh, the public to hear the argument, but only on the Friday at the end of the week of the argument. Um, and so you could go in and, and, and get the database of the audio recordings of previous uh, arguments. Um, this May, it decided to allow uh, 10 arguments to go with a live audio uh, broadcast. Um, now, the pandemic thus opened the door for anyone to hear real time the work of, of the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, the only other way you could hear it real time if the court were open was to be one of the lucky ones to sit in the audience and they had a restricted number of, 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 of seats. Now, the other interesting aspect of the Supreme Court's approach to this was to have the telephone hearing was that the questioning of the judges in terms of, 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 of order and time was, was highly controlled. And so the Chief Justice would allow each side to have two minutes um, each on their opening, but the questions would be limited and a Justice would have a specific number of time uh, organized sequentially based on, on seniority. Um, there's um, one of the uh, regular advocates before the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, Lisa Blatt, um, argued uh, the first telephone hearing. And in her preparation for the hearing, um, she, in her home, uh, had a podium and she had people on the line uh, practicing with questions and, and, and the like. And, and they had to make sure that everything was quiet and trying to hear if there's any noise in the background and, and, and the like. Um, as for trials, as Judge, as Judge Lynn said, uh, particularly if we have uh, a number of witnesses, the medium um, is, is going to be is going to be challenging. This medium for for a trial because of you know the role of cross examination and 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 the like. Um, and um, but outside of of uh, in, in the jury context, but but perhaps, and I'd be curious to hear from her about. Uh, a bench trial, that is a non-jury case, the, the extent to which she would feel comfortable having such a trial through, through this, uh, through this uh, uh, medium. Now, um, on access issues, I think one, one thing that we, we haven't really talked about, uh, but it, it, it came across indirectly, was the amount of resources, whether it be the Qatar International Court that just just planned in advance uh, to have a strong online presence and had resources to develop the technology and have it in place so the transition was fairly smooth or to have the resources that the Northern District of Dallas did at least for this one trial. Judge Lynn told you about the extent to which they have a lot of cases, you know, this concern about the backlog, how many of these can we sustain, okay? But the need for sophisticated technology and for average citizens, uh, this could pose a problem. People who want access but don't have the technology. In Dallas County, a study was just done where 25% of all family households do not have access to a broadband uh, sub subscription. Uh, for indigent individuals, access via online could be another cost that impedes an, an open courthouse. Uh, lawyers, of course, play an essential role in terms of their ability to help deal with this gap. So I would imagine there will be, be more of a, a cry for um, getting lawyers to donate uh, pro bono help in, in, in this, in this uh, realm. I think picking up on the, uh, the, one of the themes, uh, thinking about how this could translate throughout the world, looking at developing countries um, and the need to have an online filing system. Uh, the system itself, as, as, as Lord Thomas indicated and Christopher indicated, uh, prepared uh, the, uh, uh, the Cutter International Court to be accessible. And in Dallas County, they have an on, they've had an online filing system for uh, a, a number of years. But you also need people who have the technical skills, the tech masters. And I thought a fascinating observation and one that would, I think, be a really good 
uh, source of research is the ability of the rules, the court rules themselves, enable a judge to adapt or could they impede the judge? And I think Judge Lynn, if I, if I was correct, you did you have to, to get like a, a, the Court of Appeal to give you some guidance? I don't know if you did or not. What was within your inherent power? What was not within your inherent power to manage, to manage the situation? So let me just conclude and uh, say that what, what has transpired in the, in, the, in the past four months is truly, it's truly remarkable. And it will fundamentally change how courts engage in their work. It's going to fundamentally change so many, so many things, inclu including uh, education. Uh, it's going to enable certain efficiencies. It's going to have time uh, savings. Uh, I believe uh, that there will be cost, cost savings, but you're going to have to, uh, you know, put a lot of capital into it, uh, too. Um, and thinking about um, um, how far this will go really is about um, looking at technology. And there, there's technology out there that I can't even think of that will make this a, a moving, a moving uh, target. And I think we're gonna continue to see these uh, um, serious evolutions in, 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 in the process. So thank you very much. Susan, thank you so much also for bringing the insight of uh, education, legal education uh, uh, onto, the, uh, onto the, the, the table. And uh, it's exactly uh, 5 p.m. and we have approximately 30 minutes for our Q&A uh, uh, session, I will uh, display some of the questions that were posed by, uh, the, by our uh, audience and uh, uh, our speakers will then you know, have uh, the, uh, the floor to respond uh, to the questions in the same way as uh, the presentations uh, were given. So uh, uh, I will uh, first read out loud uh, for our speakers and for our audience uh, three of the questions that were posed and then we'll give the floor uh, to, to the speakers. Could our speakers share their insights on how the use of the technology may subsist beyond the current pandemic, particularly in those places where it was not used before the pre-pandemic era? Secondly, will the institution of trial change moving forward? And one of our uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, members of the audience was wondering whether, particularly uh, in the uh, American setting, this may have a long-standing uh, change effect. Thirdly, is the new way of conducting trials sustainable in the long run? And we uh, largely heard two approaches today, full online uh, uh, trial and in-person jury trial with adjustment. What is the best way forward, the former, the latter, or a combination thereof? Lord Thomas, if, if you wish, you can uh, take the floor. I do think uh, that we are in for a long-term change. Um, I, you know, being associated with the with England and Wales and with Qatar, we had gone a long way down the road uh, without uh, COVID-19 being at all a thought in our minds, simply because if you are running an international court, it's very important uh, to be able to allow people to participate as conveniently, as cheaply as possible. And that certainly is the case of a filing system and certainly the case of being able to argue interlocutory matters. Uh, secondly, as regards the mode of trial, um, and I think it's very important, as Christopher uh, Grout said, one must remember that the big work of the, of, of the court is interlocutory work and filing. But as regards a trial, I personally have always felt that there's an awful lot of we can do uh, by using video links. I conducted an inquiry uh, for the uh, Welsh Government uh, last year, and we took about 70% of the evidence uh, over video links, and it worked perfectly well, and we could get people, because we couldn't compel them to come, to volunteer to come, where they would never have made a journey uh, to do so. So I think that's where you can take evidence. I think the, you have to ask your yourself the question, do you actually need to be in the same room? Is the pressure of the room something that's important? Uh, I think uh, my own view is that the, there is something to be gained from uh, experience with, with the legislature. In our legislature in the UK, it is certainly the case uh, that <clears throat> where you are all remote and people are not present, there is much less pressure someone can speak nonsense 
um, or can speak uh, in a very uh, clear way where he says absolutely nothing for five minutes. Um, that is not possible if you're in a room where people will start to laugh at you. That isn't a problem in court, generally speaking. But I do think there are cases where the pressure of being in court is extremely important. Um, as to jury trials, which I think is the third question, it seems to me uh, here we really have to make uh, a, a detailed examination of what is practicable for the future. Um, certainly, you have to have the jury in a room. In the UK, there was some experimentation done uh, with having jurors at home and watching it on uh, a video link. That simply doesn't work. Um, but it does seem to me that you may be able to have a sort of hybrid system where you have some witnesses who can give evidence remotely, but you put, you need the jury in a room altogether. <coughs> And therefore, I think we've got to be prepared to experiment going forward uh, on how we do it. But as Judge Lynn said, there are very real practical problems, such as access to one's client, the actions. And therefore, I think you have to divide it out between civil cases, where I think there's a future uh, for litigants in person and smaller cases, you need to make more state aid available for legal aid. Uh, but for the bigger commercial cases, I think it's here to stay. Judge Lynn? Yes, uh, let me try to answer those questions as well as a few that uh, Dean Kermanian uh, posed to me. Let me begin with the latter. Um, in terms of my having permission uh, from the Court of Appeal uh, about proceeding with my trial, uh, the uh, defendant's counsel attempted to uh, stop the trial from going forward uh, by filing uh, a mandamus action in the Fifth Circuit, uh, which would have prevented the trial from going forward. The Fifth Circuit denied that request, uh, essentially holding that it was within uh, my discretion to proceed. So I didn't ask for permission, but I got permission uh, indirectly. Uh, secondly, bench trials. Uh, I think that I could uh, have a bench trial very effectively with remote technology, and a number of uh, judges in the federal system have proceeded with bench trials, including a patent case that proceeded um, in Virginia uh, post-pandemic, where the lawyers presented quite complex evidence remotely. So I think it's uh, easier uh, to do that, and I think we will see uh, more of that. The issue of access uh, of the poor is critically important. Um, if we proceed uh, to any kind of court proceeding remotely, uh, we will, and involving a jury trial, we will have to make technology available to any of our potential jurors who do not have it. Uh, we would have to furnish a hotspot, uh, an iPad, or a similar device and train people on how to use it. The problem is that that involves a lot of cost and uh, the federal courts uh, do not expect to get a very generous uh, budget from our funders in Washington. We didn't expect a very favorable budget before and now we're adding all of these technologi technological developments on top of it and we need more money and we're very pessimistic that we're going to get it. So we can't uh, proceed in the era of high technology without having uh, sufficient funding to sustain it, and I am very concerned about that. So transitioning to the other questions, uh, technology I think is here to stay, but again, we've got to have uh, the resources to sustain using it. Um, I think that clients uh, who have had access to uh, technology and arguing matters to court are not again in discussions with their lawyers about whether it is really necessary for everyone to travel to have a live proceeding and isn't it uh, a lot cheaper for them if these are done remotely. And I, I have found in my own circumstances that oral arguments conducted this way have been very effective and I think there will be pressure from clients uh, to continue that. Now, whether this will uh, institutionalize changes in jury trials, um, I think we don't know the answer to that question yet. In criminal cases, I think it won't. I don't think we will ever see 
a case where a lawyer will agree to a remote jury trial. And if they don't agree, I think judges will be very reluctant to impose that in a criminal case when there are constitutional guarantees of due process and confrontation, et cetera. I think we just are not going to see that in criminal cases. In civil cases, we might. Um, there was a, a trial conducted uh, by Zoom. It wasn't a real trial. It was uh, a trial that was designed to facilitate ADR, but the jurors participated and were selected uh, by Zoom technology. And courts are experimenting with this now. Uh, in Austin, in state court, there's recently been a call for volunteers for cases to agree that they will uh, proceed to a trial in this way with a jury uh, remotely. I'm looking for volunteers in uh, my cases as well. So far, I'm not willing to uh, impose that without agreement, but I think people are exploring it in civil matters. It's subject to uh, many challenges in terms of practicality, including those that uh, Lord Thomas mentioned, but I'm not going to rule out uh, that possibility. Um, I think that um, employing technology more effectively and efficiently is here to stay. Uh, how much it will change things for uh, ever, I just don't know. I have encouraged a lawyer uh, to stop just waxing eloquent about the way things used to be because we may never go back to the way things used to be. Uh, I've told lawyers to think about uh, actually, now uh, I may be proving what Lord Thomas said, people may be willing to say ridiculous things on online technology because they won't hear the laughter. So here goes one. Uh, I've suggested that lawyers might want to consider the possibility of a trial outside, uh, under a tent, uh, in the uh, courtyard of a law school, for example, because we can distance more easily, the risks to participants are reduced. If you have a trial outside, I think it could be done. You've got to worry about uh, the weather, particularly in Texas, where it is bloody hot at this time of year. But uh, I think that uh, our, this is a time for creativity, and I think that uh, we all should be employing our uh, creative thoughts about how to go forward, hopefully just temporarily, but maybe uh, there will be some permanent changes inevitably made. Thank you. I think the short point is that it very much depends upon the nature and type of case as to whether and to what extent the continued use of technology will be utilized. In my view, certainly in commercial cases, there is every reason to continue to use technology. And on the whole, I think the lawyers and the parties in commercial cases will come to find that it's much more uh, efficient and cost effective to do that. The commercial court in London and the international court here have both had huge successes in the last few months in terms of hearing and resolving commercial cases uh, through an online medium. And really, there are few, if any, disadvantages to, to, to doing so. Uh, that having been said, I personally believe that those same observations can't necessarily be made in relation to both criminal cases and family cases. My view would be that in both the criminal law arena and the family law arena, it's very important that uh, cases are heard physically in court, uh, largely because of the severity of what is being determined. I don't think that many defendants, for example, and victims complainants in criminal cases would feel that the justice system was necessarily um, doing right by them. Um, they may not feel that anyway, but I think less so uh, if the uh, if serious criminal cases are being determined online. And I think those same observations can be made in relation to some family cases, for example, child adoption cases, um, disputed contact cases in relation to children, um, allegations um, in relation, for example, to abuse. I, I just, it doesn't sit well with me that cases like that should be 
determined through an online medium. And so I don't think that even though technology may be being used at the moment in some of those arenas because of the pandemic, I don't think that that will continue um, once the issue uh, resolves. In relation to civil cases more generally, those cases that aren't commercial but that can properly be characterized as civil, I think it will um, depend very much on the nature of the case. Um, many courts are hearing and have heard civil cases online uh, before um, this pandemic in any event. Um, for example, earlier this year in January, I was doing two weeks worth of civil cases back in London, where I was hearing back to back cases involving allegations by holidaymakers against their tour operators and hotels based abroad in relation to substandard service and allegations of food poisoning. Now, this was before the pandemic, but it would be crazy to bring over the defendant and its witnesses from abroad to conduct those sorts of trials in person. And so we did back to back video link trials to hear the evidence from the defendant. And as a judge sitting alone, it doesn't impact in my view anyway, um, the proceedings adversely either to the claimant or to the defendant. The evidence is the same, whether it's being heard over the video link or whether it's being heard in person. The big difference, of course, is that it is much more efficient and saves a lot of time and cost um, for the proceedings to be heard that way than to require parties to physically attend. And so in those civil cases where it's appropriate for proceedings to be heard by video link, I think that has been happening in many jurisdictions before the pandemic. It's happening more so now, and there's every reason for it to continue to happen afterwards. Thank you so much, Christopher. Susan, please. Yes, um, if I could just respond to, to certain aspects of, of, of the question and, and take us back to I think it was in the, the mid 1980s when we started to have in trials uh, video depositions, that is the use of, of testimony before trial done uh, in, uh, under oath. Uh, and then uh, those depositions of key witnesses who otherwise could not appear. For example, just as Christopher said, let's assume we had a defendant outside of, 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 of the subpoena power of the court. And so we had the experience of using uh, video depositions. Sometimes they were they were highly edited, and 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 if you wanted to use uh, something to counter what was said in the video of your opposing the the, the editing of the opposing side, you had to make sure you had a good editor to 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 to, to have the full story. So so we had that uh, aspect of it already before uh, the courts, and I imagine. Uh, this has developed over the years to just an ex extensive practice. I think the most important thing just from listening to, to everyone here is sort of a sense of priority. We have to prioritize our cases and to think about which ones are ones that we can do completely online, which ones constitutionally are just impossible to do online. Are there portions of them, hearings and the like, that can be done uh, on on online, or are there going to be as as Lord Thomas said, this hybrid? They're going to be, you know, that uh, we're going to set up a hybrid a hybrid model for certain um, certain cases. And so, to that extent, it, it's difficult to answer all of those at this point. But clearly, given the constitutional mandate in the United States for for in, in criminal cases, the jury trial, I could you know see serious challenges with a complete online uh, uh, trial absent consent, which would be probably not not forthcoming. I think the second thing in, 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 in picking up on thinking about what was said here today was also the extent to which when we are preparing our graduates to, to work in the legal field, it's not just trial advocacy, it's also negotiations. And reference was made earlier to, to, to settlement. Uh, we have very sophisticated uh, mediators around the world, whether they be in local jurisdictions focused only on their own jurisdiction or dealing with international matters. The extent to which we are preparing our students as future lawyers to be able to negotiate in this medium, I think is uh, absolutely essential. Um, how, how what you say in this medium and negotiation session potentially could be taped. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously they're, they're going to be issues of, of are there codes to protect you in terms of secrecy and 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 and, and the like so it goes beyond 
uh, just the trial itself, but events leading up to the trial, the way in which uh, the uh, the uh, a case could be settled. Just another important moving target throughout all of this is the extent to which arbitration centers are rising to the fore, that are uh, getting they are prepared or dealing with uh, the fact that uh, there is a need for this this uh, venue in commercial in commercial matters. And so, if the courts can't adjust, uh, there will be this increasing emphasis to to take the matter if they can through uh, through contract and have it resolved in, in in an arbitration center. So that's something I think we just need to keep our keep keep the eye on the ball. If I if I could take the liberty, uh, 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 Professor Dimitropoulos, of asking a, a, a constitutional question, is that okay? Or are there other questions that are pressing? I'm just Curious. Yeah, I'm just curious, Judge Lynn, about the Speedy Trial Act, uh, the requirement in criminal cases that uh, we have a certain amount of time before somebody is 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 brought to trial. What's happening now, given given uh, the description of of uh, people in jails and difficulty of just dealing with the jail environment, let alone bringing them over to the courthouse? So, as a general proposition, the courts have entered orders that have uh, delayed the applicability of the Speedy Trial Act pursuant to a uh, federal statute that was adopted as part of the federal stimulus package. So uh, judges, uh, generally chief judges are making these findings under the Speedy Trial Act and uh, trial judges are making them in their own cases uh, that the circumstances here create an emergency that would uh, delay the uh, effectiveness of the Speedy Trial Act with respect to particular cases. Now, on the other hand, uh, where you have cases, as I do in these two cases I have uh, upcoming, where the defendants are both in custody pending trial, uh, if we can possibly get those cases to trial, taking into account the safety of all of the participants, including the jurors, um, I think there is pressure to do so because these persons are being kept in custody having been convicted of nothing. So uh, the, the answer to your question is there are uh, bases in the law to find that the Speedy Trial Act provisions do not apply during this emergency, but there is still practical pressure to put cases to trial to give persons who are in custody an opportunity uh, to proceed and hope for an adjudication that they are not guilty. So these things are operating uh, at the same time. Now, whether we can uh, delay the Speedy Trial Act indefinitely, uh, I don't know. And I'm expecting that uh, good defense lawyers will yep. uh, claim that their rights under the Speedy Trial Act have been uh, improperly abridged, uh, but that will be for another court other than mine to determine. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We have another uh, uh, six or seven minutes uh, to go. Uh, let us ask uh, uh, our speakers another three uh, questions and then we can uh, close. Um, uh, two more specific questions. How is the attendance of third parties ensured in trials? And the second question, so let me project those. So how is the attendance of third parties ensured in trials? Secondly, were there any medical professionals present during the hearings? I guess this is a question addressed mostly to Judge Lin. And finally, how can we ensure open courts in light of all the new uh, developments? I think that's an appropriate question uh, to, uh, to ask uh, coming to a close of our uh, webinar. Lord Thomas, the floor is yours. Attendance of third parties. Um, this obviously is something that isn't generally a problem, uh, simply because uh, they, these are court hearings, and you can compel people just as if they were uh, gay, as if you were present in court, or if the person was present in court. I don't think that's a problem. Uh, as regards medical professionals, I leave that to Judge Lynn. As regards the future, I think there is no doubt there are there is a debate to be had, and I hope universities will do some research on this. First of all, can you broadcast legal argument? No doubt, that's not a problem. 
should you broadcast witness testimony? I think this is a very difficult problem because you are putting terrible pressure on people. And, and, and thirdly, what do you do about long term access to recordings of trials and or documentation, and particularly data scraping? I think these are huge issues. One has seen how data has been used to make huge fortunes. And my understanding is that now a lot of uh, companies are looking at mining the data that's in court documents uh, to try and use this uh, profitably. I think these are very difficult questions and we haven't really turned uh, these issues uh, to enough public attention as yet. I'll speak uh, first to the presence of medical professionals. No, <clears throat> we did not have medical professionals present. Uh, I've consulted with medical professionals uh, outside the actual proceeding uh, for advice. <clears throat> I prepared a uh, handbook about my trial and sent it to uh, a medical professional for uh, comment and received interesting and helpful commentary. In terms of open courts and third parties being present, uh, we posted the availability of uh, oral access to the court proceedings um, in the courthouse, but not uh, otherwise. We cannot uh, make the recording uh, of the video available to the public for the reasons I've described that is uh, prohibited by our United States Supreme Court. But any uh, parties that wanted to listen to the proceedings uh, could do so uh, in the courthouse and could even watch them uh, as long as they were in the adjunct uh, courtroom, uh, but without any device that would enable them to uh, record. So we publish on our website um, and in our dockets in each case when we are conducting these proceedings uh, so that people can participate in the run of the mill case, although there might be cases that involve uh, trade secrets or other confidential matters where we would be required to reduce access as we would in a court proceeding if persons came live to uh, participate. Thank you, Jigeline. Christopher. I don't really have much to add to what's already been said, but what I would say, uh, something perhaps to reflect on, is that whilst it's true that the court has the same powers as it would have if it were operating physically, uh, when it's operating virtually. There are, of course, practical issues. Uh, for example, when you're conducting a normal, by which I mean in-person hearing, it's very unusual, certainly in my experience, for parties, for witnesses, for lawyers to, to behave in a way which is unacceptable to the court and in a way which the court has to take action. For example, either by chastising or by by um, by finding in the worst cases that, that that someone is in contempt. That's very rare in a in a physical hearing. Uh, but when a case is being conducted purely online, although the court's powers may be the same, the exercise of them is going to be, I would say, quite difficult. Because if you have a witness, for example, who is being cross-examined over the video link and they get particularly upset by a line of questioning, it's very easy for them just to press the off button and there's not a lot you can do about it. If, 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 if someone has simply had enough of the proceedings and they decide to switch off, what are you going to do about it? Um, uh, of course, there are orders you can make after the event, but it's not going to help you with the progress of the hearing. So although, although I agree that in theory, everything is the same, there are perhaps practical issues that might arise from time to time. Yeah, I, 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 I imagine that uh, we'll just hit that uh, end button and everything will just be gone as if court never, never happened. Uh, and one thing I was thinking about, Christopher, as well, when you were talking about trans-border issues, the extent to which that um, local law, in a, you know, where witnesses could easily come into play more than, than when we had the, the person flying over to London and, and, and the like. On the third party issue, I understood the question a little bit along the lines of, could you compel um, a third party come down to the courthouse and testify and perhaps that person is, is fearful of the virus and ways in which perhaps that could be accommodated um, and be able to do um, 
subject to, to, to of course, the, the parties' agreement and, and the process uh, and activities of the courts, uh, but uh, perhaps by way of video, a video deposition and, uh, and, and the like uh, in a secure, in a, in a, in a secure uh, place. That's more of a, an example of the blended approach that we were talking about earlier. I do think it's interesting that in terms of, of the, the pandemic, the extent to which, as Laura Thomas had indicated, for, for hearings that don't involve uh, uh, trials, that we are seeing an uptick in terms of public, public access online to this information. Some courts having, having uh, argument, whether it be by audio available real time or also uh, by, by video. But I do agree with the general sentiment uh, and concerns about having virtual uh, virtual uh, trials. And so uh, with with that, I just uh, want to thank everybody for participating. I know George will say a few concluding words too, but we also got some ideas today for additional research. So some of our students who are out here uh, listening, I hope you uh, took some good notes because some of you may be interested in writing papers on, on some of the issues that were raised uh, today. Uh, but again, on behalf of Muhammad bin Khalifa University College of Law, I just want to thank uh, uh, Judge uh, or Lord Thomas, Judge Lynn, uh, uh, Christopher, uh, George, for your wonderful participation and leadership in, in this event. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, uh, let me also add a couple of uh, uh, words of thanks to uh, uh, some more people that uh, have made this event uh, possible. Sandia Monis at HPKU uh, College of Law, uh, Ezzedine Abdenebi, uh, HPKU, as well as Tarek El Depsi from our communications department, as well as Omar Ashur from the Qatar International Court in Dispute. Of course, uh, close again by thanking uh, our audience for their patience, their questions. And of course, our, uh, our speakers for the wonderful presentations and the discussion, we're really grateful uh, to you. And the time's been as such, we look forward to seeing you again uh, soon in our next virtual meeting in the beginning of, uh, of uh, September. Thank you very much again. Thank you all. Bye-bye.